Barry Gardner. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker, and I refer to my entry in the Register of Interest. Mr Deputy Speaker, I know you were not around at the time, but you will know that the Stone Age did not end because of a lack of stone, and the Oil Age will not end because of a lack of oil. It will end because decent people of all political persuasions, like the former Right Honourable Member for Kingswood, are far-sighted enough to recognise and brave enough to stand up against the vested interests that would consign our children and the natural world to a costly, disruptive and, frankly, terrifying future. He was right to say that history will judge harshly those who continue down the reckless fossil fuel path that this bill represents. This bill is founded upon a lie. In fact, several lies. The government says it will safeguard our domestic energy supplies and boost investment. It will not. They say it will enhance our energy security and reduce our dependence on imports from overseas. It will not. The truth is, it is a political distraction that will reduce investment in and delay our transition to the clean energy, which is the only sustainable and secure future both for our country and for the global community. This bill is not a credible plan to fix Britain's broken energy system. It is a sad attempt to sow division and polarise our politics. It shows that the government has given up governing and is out of step with the British people's priorities. When six million people live in fuel poverty, when last winter 4,700 people died as a result of living in cold, damp homes, this bill falls well below what our constituents deserve. As the world's hottest year on record was concluding, nearly 200 countries agreed at COP28 to transition away from fossil fuels. The contrast between the promise made in Dubai and what the government seeks to do today could not be more profound, yes, yes. nor more depressing. By inviting Parliament to enable annual licensing rounds for offshore oil and gas extraction, the government is failing to understand that to transition away from fossil fuels, you have to stop producing them. <laughs> The government argued, but it is still a declining field. This simply slows the rate of decline, they say. The problem is that it also slows the rate of investment in a just transition that will unleash the power of wind, solar, tidal and energy efficiency. The North Sea is a declining basin. It res its reserves are predominantly oil, not gas. Between now and 2050, new licences are expected to provide just 103 days of gas. That's four days' worth of gas on average each year. The government knows that once oil and gas is licensed, it then belongs to the companies that hold that licence. And as the government recently admitted to my honourable friend, the member for Brighton Kemp Town, 80% of UK oil reserves are sent abroad by these companies and sold on the international market to the highest bidder. No wonder the former executive director of BP said last year that the government's decision to expand North Sea drilling, and I quote, is not going to make any difference to Britain's energy security. If the government's ambition is to minimise gas imports, then there is a very simple solution. Insulate homes. The best way to cut imports is to reduce domestic fossil fuel consumption by building renewables and insulating homes. This would have the additional benefit of reducing people's energy bills and tackling fuel poverty. By channelling investment into oil and gas, it is heading precisely in the wrong direction. Now, I, I do not deny there is a role for existing oil and gas, but it is in the journey to a clean energy economy. 
What there is not a role for is the production of new oil and gas. We already know that to stand a 50% chance of keeping below the 1.5 degree threshold, 90% of the world's coal reserves and 60% of oil and gas reserves would have to stay in the ground. The logic of... I, I, I will give way to the Honourable. I just wondered if he's aware of... He mentioned the, the pathway to um, the one and a half degree target. Now, IEEA's uh, description of what is required to be three to four percent reduction in oil and gas production year, uh, year on year between now and 2050. Does he agree with the assessment of the NSTA themselves who, who expect that even with the new oil and gas licence, North Sea oil and gas is, is predicted to decline by seven percent, twice that amount? I, I, I'm well aware of that. Of course I am. Um, but he will have heard the discussion that, that's taken place uh, earlier uh, about global leadership. He will, have, he will know that actually other countries around the world are not declining at the required rate. Uh, and actually, leadership is about taking a lead. Um, the logic of drilling for more when the world has already more than it can safely burn is that of the myopic salesman not the visionary politician. Or to use the Prime Minister's words, it's the logic of the zealot. The government's actions are already making the UK a less attractive place for green investment. Mm. Three quarters of all North Sea oil and gas operators currently invest nothing in UK renewables at all. The largest operator, Harbour Energy, has ruled such clean investment out altogether. Yet last year, the five oil super majors, BP, Shell, Chevron, ExxonMobil and Total Energies, rewarded their investors with record payouts of more than £79 billion. Pounds. So we know the money is there to do it. The Minister is asking whether I will give way. Um, the Right Honourable Member has, has long confused the the scoring of party political points with the ability to debate an issue in order to arrive at the truth and get decent policies out the other end. But if he's changed the habit of a lifetime, I'll happily give way to him. Well, I thank the Honourable Gentleman. I just thought, as he mentioned, the specific company of Harbour Energy, that they are absolutely investing in the Viking carbon capture um, centre and are playing a positive role, and that is true of the whole oil and glass supply chain, which in this country, if the honourable gentleman went and visited them, he would find that they're working right across the energy sector and weakening one part as he would with no new licences damages the clean emerging sectors too. Can, can I say to the Minister, um, I recognise the work that, that Harbour Energy are doing, and I also recognise the work that the government's done in trying to attract more investment into green energy and renewables. And, and I welcome that work. I want us to have a cross-party consensus around getting to net zero. The trouble is, and he knows this to be true, that he and many people on his side, including the Prime Minister, have actually tried to make this a wedge issue, a political issue, to divide people. And I think he really does need to step up to the plate. If he wants cross-party consensus, then he has to try and build it, not score cheap political points. Um, of course, I'll give away. So, so the Liberal Democrats were actually introducing um, a, an amendment to stop flaring and vent, venting of methane. The Honourable Member for Stoke Central has just said it would be a, a very good thing to do, and yet the government opposed it. Is that ju just not exactly where we could have reached cross-party consensus? But the Honourable Lady is absolutely correct. Um, and I, I, I listened to the, the attempt at the intervention uh, on, on the colleague uh, uh, across the way. But this is the way in which we need to build a cross-party consensus because actually, you know, there are really concerned members on the government benches who do want to do the right thing. And we all know sometimes the whips make sure that they don't. Um, but actually, if we really build this consensus, we can get to the right place. Look, another lie at the heart of this bill is to say it will protect British jobs. It won't. 
Over the years, there have been hundreds of thousands of jobs in the oil and gas sector and its supply chain. They've kept our lights on and our industry moving for decades, just as the coal miners did before them. But pretending that employment in oil and gas can last forever fails to properly prepare those workers and their families for the inevitable transition that the world is making. Despite sustained support for the North Sea Basin over the past 14 years, despite 400 new drilling licenses being issued across five separate licensing rounds, the fact is that more than 200,000 jobs in the wider oil and gas industry and its wider supply network have been lost. Today, 30,000 hard-working people are directly employed in the industry. These workers and the local economies they uphold need a coherent plan to move past fossil fuel production towards clean energy. The trouble is the government has not developed one. There are further 100,000 individuals who are supported through the supply chain, waiting, waiting for a signal from government so they can seize the opportunities of the clean energy revolution. This bill offers them nothing. The bill seems to override the already weak non-binding climate compatibility checkpoint. The production emissions reduction target as set out in the North Sea transition deal is already weak setting out a cut of only 50% by 2030. This bill seems to weaken it even further. It includes no reference as to how, low, uh, as to how annual licensing will be judged against the NSTD targets for production emissions, let alone emissions from combustion. Critically, the bill ignores the wider environmental consequences of development of new fields, and it puts marine habitats at risk. Over a third of the 900 locations in the latest licensing round overlapped with marine protected areas. And yet this directly contradicts the commitment the UK made at the Convention on Biological Diversity Conference COP15 in Montreal, where we promised to protect 30% of UK waters for nature by 2030. The Rosebank Field, which was recently licensed, sees a pipeline run through the Faroe Shetland Marine Protected Area, which threatens ocean life. If a major oil spill from Rosebank were to happen, 20 MPAs could be seriously impacted. This bill is an attack on nature, both by its indirect impact through increasing emissions, but also its direct impact on the marine environment. The government appear to believe they know better than the International Energy Agency, the United Nations Secretary General, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, and hundreds of the world's leading scientists, all of whom are clear that new oil and gas licenses jeopardize further the goal of 1.5 degrees Celsius. This Parliament's own independent advisor, the Committee on Climate Change, confirmed to Parliament only last year that the expansion of fossil fuel production is not in line with net zero and that the oil and gas fuel that is required in the UK as we make that journey to net zero does not require the development of any new fields. But what I find most depressing about this bill is not its arrogance, it's not its ignorance. It's the way it seeks to break with the cross-party consensus for the sake of creating a party political dividing line in advance of a general election. That dividing line pretends that the rational, informed, scientific view is held only by what the Prime Minister calls climate zealots. And it tries to establish the recalcitrant fossil fuel lobby that is endangering all that we hold dear across the globe as the reasonable middle ground. It is not. As the United Nations Secretary General, Antonio Guterres, said, the truly dangerous radicals are the countries that are increasing the production of fossil fuels. The fossil fuel lobby is behaving like the tobacco lobby did when all the medical evidence was against it. First, deny the science outright. When that is no longer credible, pretend that the concern is exaggerated. And when that is no longer credible, 
reframe the issue as one of personal choice. Mm. Yeah. Government is about establishing a framework of regulation for the public good. It's not about facilitating the freedom of those who would undermine the public good. That is why this bill is bad for democracy. That is why this bill is bad for our global standing as a country that has previously been regarded as a leader on this issue. That leadership is now passing to others who are responding positively to the pledge in Dubai to transition away from fossil fuels by joining the Beyond Oil and Gas Alliance. The floods we are seeing devastate communities and lives around the country are but a foretaste of the terrifying impacts of climate change beyond 1.5 degrees. This bill does nothing to mitigate them. It does nothing to support the billions of people across the world who live on the front lines of climate breakdown. It ignores the plight of millions of bill payers who find themselves priced out of our broken energy system, and it ignores the workers who power our country. This bill endangers our natural world and future generations. I cannot support it. I'll consign it to the same vote of no confidence that I predict awaits this government later on this year. David